Chapter 24 Drawn to the Lodestone Rock In such risings of fire and risings of sea, the firm earth shaken by the rushes of an angry ocean which had now no ebb, but was always on the flow, higher and higher, to the terror and wonder of the beholders on the shore, three years of tempest were consumed. Three more birthdays of little Lucy had been woven by the golden thread into the peaceful tissue of the life of her home. Many a night and many a day had its inmates listened to the echoes in the corner, with hearts that failed them when they heard the thronging feet, for the footsteps had become to their minds as the footsteps of a people tumultuous under a red flag, and with their country declared in danger, changed into wild beasts by terrible enchantment long persisted in. Monseigneur, as a class, had dissociated himself from the phenomenon of his not being appreciated of his being so little wanted in France as to incur considerable danger of receiving his dismissal from it and this life together. Like the fabled rustic who raised the devil with infinite pains and was so terrified at the sight of him that he could ask the enemy no question but immediately fled, so Monseigneur after boldly reading the Lord's Prayer backwards for a great number of years, and performing many other potent spells for compelling the evil one, no sooner beheld him in his terrors than he took to his noble heels. The shining bull's-eye of the court was gone, or it would have been the mark for a hurricane of national bullets. It had never been a good eye to see with, had long had the moat in it of Lucifer's pride, Sardanapalus's luxury and a mole's blindness, but it had dropped out and was gone. The court, from that exclusive inner circle to its outermost rotten ring of intrigue, corruption, and dissimulation, was all gone together. Royalty was gone, had been besieged in its palace and suspended when the last tidings came over. The August of the year 1792 was come, and Monseigneur was by this time scattered far and wide. As was natural, the headquarters and great gathering place of Monseigneur in London was Telson's Bank. Spirits are supposed to haunt the places where their bodies most resorted, and Monseigneur without a guinea haunted the spot where his guineas used to be. Moreover, it was the spot to which such French intelligence as was most to be relied upon came quickest. Again, Telson's was a munificent house, and extended great liberality to old customers who had fallen from their high estate. Again, those nobles who had seen the coming storm in time, and anticipating plunder or confiscation, had made provident remittances to Telson's, were always to be heard of there by their needy brethren, to which it must be added that every newcomer from France reported himself and his tidings at Telson's almost as a matter of course. For such variety of reasons, Telson's was at that time, as to French intelligence, a kind of high exchange, and this was so well known to the public, and the inquiries made there were in consequence so numerous, that Telson sometimes wrote the latest news out in a line or so and posted it in the bank windows, for all who ran through Temple Bar to read. On a steaming, misty afternoon, Mr. Lorry sat at his desk, and Charles Darnay stood leaning on it, talking with him in a low voice. The penitential den once set apart for interviews with the house was now the news exchange, and was filled to overflowing. It was within half an hour or so of the time of closing. But although you are the youngest man that ever lived, said Charles Darnay, rather hesitating, I must still suggest to you, I understand, that I am too old, said Mr. Lorry. Unsettled weather, a long journey, uncertain means of travelling, a disorganised country, a city that may not be even safe for you. My dear Charles, said Mr. Lorry, with cheerful confidence. You touch some of the reasons for my going, not for my staying away. 
It is safe enough for me. Nobody will care to interfere with an old fellow of hard upon four score, when there are so many people there much better worth interfering with. As to its being a disorganized city, if it were not a disorganized city, there would be no occasion to send somebody from our house here, to our house there, who knows the city and the business of old, and is in Telson's confidence. As to the uncertain travelling, the long journey, and the winter weather, if I were not prepared to submit myself to a few inconveniences for the sake of Telson's, after all these years, who ought to be? I wish I were going myself, said Charles Downey, somewhat restlessly, and like one thinking aloud. Indeed! You are a pretty fellow to object and advise, exclaimed Mr. Lorry. You wish you were going yourself, and you a Frenchman born. You are a wise counsellor. My dear Mr. Lorry, it is because I am a Frenchman born that the thought, which I did not mean to utter here, however, has passed through my mind often. One cannot help thinking, having had some sympathy for the miserable people, and having abandoned something to them, he spoke here in his former thoughtful manner, that one might be listened to, might have the power to persuade to some restraint. Only last night, after you had left us, when I was talking to Lucy— When you were talking to Lucy, Mr. Lorry repeated. Yes, I wonder you are not ashamed to mention the name of Lucy, wishing you were going to France at this time of day. However, I am not going, said Charles Downey with a smile. It is more to the purpose that you say you are, and I am, in plain reality. The truth is, my dear Charles— Mr. Lorry glanced at the distant house and lowered his voice. You can have no conception of the difficulty with which our business is transacted, and of the peril in which our books and papers over yonder are involved. The Lord above knows what the compromising consequences would be to numbers of people if some of our documents were seized or destroyed, and they might be at any time, you know, for who can say that Paris is not set afire today or sacked tomorrow? Now, a judicious selection from these, with the least possible delay, and the burying of them, or otherwise getting of them out of harm's way, is within the power, without loss of precious time, of scarcely any one but myself, if any one. And shall I hang back, when Telson's knows this and says this? Telson's, whose bread I have eaten these sixty years, because I am a little stiff about the joints?' Why, I am a boy, sir, to half a dozen old codgers here. <laughs> How I admire the gallantry of your youthful spirit, Mr. Lorry. Touch! Nonsense, sir. And, my dear Charles, said Mr. Lorry, glancing at the house again, you are to remember that getting things out of Paris at this present time, no matter what things, is next to an impossibility. Papers and precious matters were this very day brought to us here— I speak in strict confidence. It is not business-like to whisper it, even to you, by the strangest bearers you can imagine, every one of whom had his head hanging on by a single hair as he passed the barriers. At another time our parcels would come and go as easily as in business-like old England, but now everything is stopped. And do you really go tonight? I really go tonight, for the case has become too pressing to admit of delay. And do you take no one with you? All sorts of people have been proposed to me, but I will have nothing to say to any of them. I intend to take Jerry. Jerry has been my bodyguard on Sunday nights for a long time past, and I am used to him. Nobody will suspect Jerry of being anything but an English bulldog, or of having any design in his head but to fly at anybody who touches his master. I must say again that I heartily admire your gallantry and youthfulness. I must say again, nonsense, nonsense. When I have executed this little commission, I shall perhaps accept Telson's proposal to retire and live at my ease. Time enough, then, to think about growing old. This dialogue had taken place at Mr. Lorry's usual desk, with Monseigneur swarming within a yard or two of it, boastful of what he would do to avenge himself on the rascal people before long. It was too much the way of Monseigneur under his reverses as a refugee, and it was much too much the way of native British orthodoxy to talk of this terrible revolution 
as if it were the only harvest ever known under the skies that had not been sown, as if nothing had ever been done or omitted to be done that had led to it, as if observers of the wretched millions in France and of the misused and perverted resources that should have made them prosperous had not seen it inevitably coming years before and had not in plain words recorded what they saw. Such vaporing, combined with the extravagant plots of Monseigneur for the restoration of a state of things that had utterly exhausted itself and worn out heaven and earth as well as itself, was hard to be endured without some remonstrance by any sane man who knew the truth. And it was such vaporing all about his ears, like a troublesome confusion of blood in his own head, added to a latent uneasiness in his mind, which had already made Charles Darnay restless, and which still kept him so. Among the talkers was Striver of the King's Bench Bar, far on his way to state promotion, and therefore loud on the theme. Broaching to Monseigneur his devices for blowing the people up, and exterminating them from the face of the earth, and doing without them, and for accomplishing many similar objects akin in their nature to the abolition of eagles by sprinkling salt on the tails of the race. Him Darnay heard with a particular feeling of objection, and Darnay stood divided between going away that he might hear no more, and remaining to interpose his word when the thing that was to be went on to shape itself out. The house approached Mr. Lorry and laid a soiled and unopened letter before him, asked if he had yet discovered any traces of the person to whom it was addressed. The house laid the letter down so close to Darnay that he saw the direction, the more quickly because it was his own right name. The address, turned into English, ran, Very pressing, to Monsieur heretofore the Marquis Saint-Evremont of France, confided to the cares of Messrs. Telson and Co., bankers, London, England. On the marriage morning, Dr. Manette had made it his one urgent and express request to Charles Darnay that the secret of this name should be, unless he the doctor dissolved the obligation, kept inviolate between them. Nobody else knew it to be his name. His own wife had no suspicion of the fact. Mr. Lorry could have none. No, said Mr. Lorry in reply to the house. I have referred it, I think, to everybody now here, and no one can tell me where this gentleman is to be found. The hands of the clock, verging upon the hour of closing the bank, there was a general set of the current of talkers past Mr. Lorry's desk. He held the letter out inquiringly, and Monseigneur looked at it in the person of this plotting and indignant refugee, and Monseigneur looked at it in the person of that plotting and indignant refugee, and this, that, and the other all had something disparaging to say, in French or in English, concerning the Marquis, who was not to be found. Nephew, I believe, but in any case degenerate successor, of the polished Marquis who was murdered, said one. Happy to say I never knew him. A craven who abandoned his post, said another, this Monseigneur had been got out of Paris, legs uppermost and half suffocated in a load of hay, some years ago. Infected with the new doctrines, said a third, eyeing the direction through his glass in passing, set himself in opposition to the last Marquis, abandoned the estates when he inherited them, and left them to the ruffian herd. They will recompense him now, I hope, as he deserves. Hey, cried the blatant striver. Did he, though? Is that the sort of fellow? Let us look at his infamous name. Damn the fellow! Darnay, unable to restrain himself any longer, touched Mr. Striver on the shoulder and said, I know the fellow. Do you, by Jupiter? said Striver. I am sorry for it. Why? Why, Mr. Darnay? Do you hear what he did? Don't ask why in these times, but I do ask why. Then I tell you again, Mr. Darnay, I am sorry for it. I am sorry to hear you putting any such extraordinary questions. Here is a fellow who, infected by the most pestilent and blasphemous code of devilry that ever was known, abandoned his property to the vilest scum of the earth that ever did murder by wholesale, and you ask me why I am sorry that a man who instructs youth 
knows him? Well, but I'll answer you. I am sorry because I believe there is contamination in such a scoundrel. That's why. Mindful of the secret, Darnay with great difficulty checked himself and said, You may not understand the gentleman. I understand how to put you in a corner, Mr. Darnay, said Bully's driver, and I'll do it. If this fellow is a gentleman, I don't understand him. You may tell him so with my compliments. You may also tell him, from me, that after abandoning his worldly goods and position to this butcherly mob, I wonder he is not at the head of them. But no, gentlemen, said Stryver, looking all round and snapping his fingers. I know something of human nature, and I tell you that you'll never find a fellow like this fellow trusting himself to the mercies of such precious protégés. No, gentlemen, he'll always show him a clean pair of heels very early in the scuffle and sneak away. With those words, and a final snap of his fingers, Mr. Stryver shouldered himself into Fleet Street amidst the general approbation of his hearers. Mr. Lorry and Charles Darnay were left alone at the desk in the general departure from the bank. "'Will you take charge of the letter?' said Mr. Lorry. "'You know where to deliver it?' "'I do.' Will you undertake to explain that we suppose it to have been addressed here on the chance of our knowing where to forward it, and that it has been here some time? I will do so. Do you start for Paris from here? From here at eight. I will come back to see you off. Very ill at ease with himself, and with Stryver, and most other men, Darnay made the best of his way into the quiet of the temple, opened the letter, and read it. These were its contents. Prison of the Abbé, Paris, June 21st, 1792. Monsieur, heretofore, the Marquis. After having long been in danger of my life at the hands of the village, I have been seized with great violence and indignity and brought a long journey on foot to Paris. On the road I have suffered a great deal. Nor is that all. My house has been destroyed, razed to the ground. The crime for which I am imprisoned, Monsieur Hito for the Marquis, for which I shall be summoned before the tribunal, and shall lose my life without your so generous help, is, they tell me, treason against the majesty of the people, in that I have acted against them for an emigrant. It is in vain I represent that I have acted for them, and not against, according to your commands. It is in vain I represent that before the sequestration of emigrant property I had remitted the imposts they had ceased to pay, that I had collected no rent, that I had had recourse to no process. The only response is that I have acted for an emigrant, and where is that emigrant? Ah, most gracious monsieur heretofore the Marquis, where is that emigrant? I cry in my sleep, where is he? I demand of heaven, will he not come to deliver me? No answer. Ah, monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, I send my desolate cry across the sea, hoping it may perhaps reach your ears through the great bank of Tilson known at Paris. For the love of heaven, of justice, of generosity, of the honour of your noble name, I supplicate you, monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, to succour and release me. My fault is that I have been true to you. Oh, monsieur, heretofore the Marquis, I pray you, be you true to me. From this prison here of horror, whence I every hour tend nearer and nearer to destruction, I send you, Monsieur heretofore the Marquis, the assurance of my dolorous and unhappy service, your afflicted Gabelle. The latent uneasiness in Darnay's mind was roused to vigorous life by this letter. The peril of an old servant, and a good one, whose only crime was fidelity to himself and his family, stared him so reproachfully in the face, that as he walked to and fro in the temple, considering what to do, he almost hid his face from the passers-by. He knew very well that in his horror of the deed which had culminated the bad deeds and bad reputation of the old family house, in his resentful suspicions of his uncle, and in the aversion with which his conscience regarded the crumbling fabric that he was supposed to uphold, he had acted imperfectly. He knew very well that in his love for Lucy, his renunciation of his social place, though by no means new to his own mind, 
had been hurried and incomplete. He knew that he ought to have systematically worked it out and supervised it, and that he had meant to do it, and that it had never been done. The happiness of his own chosen English home, the necessity of being always actively employed, the swift changes and troubles of the time which had followed one another so fast that the events of this week annihilated the immature plans of last week, and the events of the week following made all new again, he knew very well that to the force of these circumstances he had yielded, not without disquiet, but still without continuous and accumulating resistance. That he had watched the times for a time of action, and that they had shifted and struggled until the time had gone by, and the nobility were trooping from France by every highway and byway, and their property was in course of confiscation and destruction, and their very names were blotting out, was as well known to himself as it could be to any new authority in France that might impeach him for it. But he had oppressed no man. He had imprisoned no man. He was so far from having harshly exacted payment of his dues that he had relinquished them of his own will, thrown himself on a world with no favour in it, won his own private place there, and earned his own bread. Monsieur Gabel had held the impoverished and involved estate on written instructions to spare the people, to give them what little there was to give, such fuel as the heavy creditors would let them have in the winter, and such produce as could be saved from the same grip in the summer, and no doubt he had put the fact in plea and proof for his own safety, so that it could not but appear now. This favoured the desperate resolution Charles Darnay had begun to make, that he would go to Paris. Yes, like the mariner in the old story, the winds and streams had driven him within the influence of the lodestone rock, and it was drawing him to itself, and he must go. Everything that arose before his mind drifted him on faster and faster, more and more steadily to the terrible attraction. His latent uneasiness had been that bad aims were being worked out in his own unhappy land by bad instruments, and that he, who could not fail to know that he was better than they, was not there trying to do something to stay bloodshed and assert the claims of mercy and humanity. With this uneasiness half-stifled and half-reproaching him, he had been brought to the pointed comparison of himself with the brave old gentleman in whom duty was so strong. Upon that comparison, injurious to himself, had instantly followed the sneers of Monseigneur, which had stung him bitterly, and those of Striver, which above all were coarse and galling for old reasons. Upon those had followed Gabelle's letter, the appeal of an innocent prisoner in danger of death, to his justice, honour, and good name. His resolution was made. He must go to Paris. Yes, the lodestone rock was drawing him, and he must sail on until he struck. He knew of no rock. He saw hardly any danger. The intention with which he had done what he had done, even although he had left it incomplete, presented it before him in an aspect that would be gratefully acknowledged in France on his presenting himself to assert it. Then, that glorious vision of doing good, which is so often the sanguine mirage of so many good minds, arose before him, and he even saw himself in the illusion with some influence to guide this raging revolution that was running so fearfully wild. As he walked to and fro with his resolution made, he considered that neither Lucy nor her father must know of it until he was gone. Lucy should be spared the pain of separation, and her father, always reluctant to turn his thoughts towards the dangerous ground of old, should come to the knowledge of the step as a step taken and not in the balance of suspense and doubt. How much of the incompleteness of his situation was referable to her father through the painful anxiety to avoid reviving old associations of France in his mind, he did not discuss with himself. But that circumstance, too, had had its influence in his course. He walked to and fro with thoughts very busy, until it was time to return to Telson's and take leave of Mr. Lorry. As soon as he arrived in Paris, he would present himself to this old friend, but he must say nothing of his intention now. 
A carriage with post horses was ready at the bank door, and Jerry was booted and equipped. I have delivered that letter, said Charles Darnay to Mr. Lorry. I would not consent to your being charged with any written answer, but perhaps you will take a verbal one? That I will, and readily, said Mr. Lorry, if it is not dangerous. Not at all, though it is to a prisoner in the Abbey. What is his name? said Mr. Lorry, with his open pocket-book in his hand. Gabelle. Gabelle. And what is the message to the unfortunate Gabelle in prison? Simply that he has received the letter and will come. Any time mentioned? He will start upon his journey tomorrow night. Any person mentioned? No. He helped Mr. Lorry to wrap himself in a number of coats and cloaks, and went out with him from the warm atmosphere of the old bank into the misty air of Fleet Street. Uh, "'My love to Lucy, and to little Lucy,' said Mr. Lorry at parting, "'and take precious care of them till I come back.' Charles Darnay shook his head and doubtfully smiled as the carriage rolled away. That night, it was the 14th of August, he sat up late and wrote two fervent letters— one was to Lucy, explaining the strong obligation he was under to go to Paris, and showing her, at length, the reasons that he had for feeling confident that he could become involved in no personal danger there. The other was to the doctor, confiding Lucy and their dear child to his care, and dwelling on the same topics with the strongest assurances. To both, he wrote that he would dispatch letters in proof of his safety immediately after his arrival. It was a hard day, that day of being among them, with the first reservation of their joint lives on his mind. It was a hard matter to preserve the innocent deceit of which they were profoundly unsuspicious. But an affectionate glance at his wife, so happy and busy, made him resolute not to tell her what impended. He had been half moved to do it. So strange it was to him to act in anything without her quiet aid and the day passed quickly. Early in the evening he embraced her and her scarcely less dear namesake, pretending that he would return by and by. An imaginary engagement took him out, and he had secreted a valise of clothes ready. And so he emerged into the heavy mist of the heavy streets, with a heavier heart. The unseen force was drawing him fast to itself now and all the tides and winds were setting straight and strong towards it. He left his two letters with a trusty porter, to be delivered half an hour before midnight and no sooner, took horse for Dover, and began his journey. For the love of heaven, of justice, of generosity, of the honour of your noble name, was the poor prisoner's cry with which he strengthened his sinking heart, as he left all that was dear on earth behind him, and floated away for the lodestone rock. The End of the Second Book